Welcome to Data Center Pulse. Today's episode is on the eBay Modular Data Center RFP Round 2. This is about our Salt Lake City Data Center. So a couple months ago, we put this RFP out, and uh, now we have selected the five finalists. And today's show, I've got... My name is Mike Lewis. I'm the Director for Mission Critical Engineering for eBay, and I work for Dean. Uh, my name is James Monahan, and I work for California Data Center Design Group, and I help Mike through this process. Great. So let me tell you a little bit about Project Quicksilver. So this is our brand new modular data center, multi-tier uh, deployment that's going to be in Salt Lake City, next to our Tier 4 data center. And we put out to the public that we want to have one of the 15-acre plots developed to be able to handle uh, a data center that would scale to 30 megawatts, 4 megawatts day one, but it has to be multi-tier to be able to select through that. It has to be high temp, it has to have modularity for both containers and rack deployments, etc., and a number of other parameters that we put into the RFP. So let's talk about the process itself. Sure, so the process was very similar to what we did in Phoenix with Project Mercury mm -hmm. in that we developed an RFP, which was, um, which was an interesting process to go through, and the RFP that we put together for Mercury was very challenging for the designers that mm -hmm. that submitted on it. We made it even more challenging for Salt Lake City and for Quicksilver, uh, primarily due to the fact that they were starting with an open canvas. We wanted them to be more modular. We wanted them to be more efficient mm -hmm. than Phoenix. We wanted them to be uh, to be able to use the space most effectively. And also, we didn't know what the mixture of containers versus racks are for the space. So they had to be able to handle all of that the most effectively. Okay. So we put the RFP together. We, we basically put an open invitation out to the industry saying, hey, if you're qualified to build data centers, we will, we will give you this RFP mm -hmm. and you have the ability to, to participate and to send us a response. So we actually had sent out, or we had 68 companies actually respond and say, hey, we want the RFP. Out of those, we actually sent it to 61 separate companies, which was a much greater uh, ratio, uh, ratio yeah. or much greater turnout than we had last time for Mercury. So I was very pleased about that. That was one, I think one of the lessons learned from Mercury was we didn't, we didn't give the industry enough time to respond. We didn't have the RFP open for a long enough time. Right. Um, so I think that's one of the things that we did better. Um, and then on October 7th, we got actually 20 responses back, which was a greater response rate than we had last time as well. So I was very happy about that. We had a very wide range of responses and, and a lot of uh, uh, excitement and effort in the industry to put those responses together. Okay. And so what was different about the responses? I mean, the 20 that we had compared to what we had in the past. Well, I definitely think the responses this time were of a higher quality. There was, um, you know, and it was very different in that, Mike mentioned it a second ago, that when we did Project Mercury, we had a building and we had a defined space that they had to work in, and this, yeah. was, this was it. In this project, you know, they had a 15-acre plot, and they could, do we had actually three 15-acre plots. They could choose any one of them and have at it. So that was very different. When it came to actually selecting the design teams um, and the design, when once we got the submissions, we based it upon three things, the same as Project Mercury, three areas, if I could say that, mm -hmm. design, the RFP submission, and then the, the, the team itself and the company who are responding. Um, Their ability to actually do. To deliver, process. right. Mm -hmm. um, within design, the biggest difference that we had this time with the scoring was we added more, or we basically put more emphasis on the concept. Mm -hmm. um, so that carried more weight this time. Um, then you had the usual things, reliability, availability, modularity, multi-temp, how their mm -hmm. electrical mechanical design, how they solved all that. Mm -hmm. um, but really the big difference this time in the actual scoring, it was more about a building concept than a... Yeah. You know. So there's a lot more architecture involved in this. And and very different, too, that we had people were confused about a design, design bid build or, or something in the past. This was... Yeah, right. And I think we were pretty clear about that. And we said, hey, we want a design only. We did have some people come back and say, hey, are you, were you interested in if we can build it to, right. you know, also doing that? And we said, eh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. We want a design first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that so that was an uh, interesting part of the process, and I think we clarified that right okay. up front pretty well. And so the scoring itself, like you said, we had more towards the concept, and then also the abilities of the, the right because it was it was critical as to how 
the designer utilize the space that they had and being able to handle containers or raised floor yeah. rack spaces. And, and, and that was one of the first questions we got was, hey, what's going to be the ratio of containers to rack spaces? And we said, we don't know. Right. So when we say that, you have to plan for almost maximum containers or maximum white floor space utilizing all right. the all the power available. So that so that was so we gave a lot of emphasis to that because that was greatly important to the functionality of the building as as we build it and as we grow into it sure. knowing that we don't know how we're going to grow into it. Yeah, and and that's a challenge back out to the industry too because in the end we want flexibility. We want modularity and so yeah, we want to deploy all containers or all racks or a mixture of it at different temps or different styles at different vendors. And and that's <laughs> that's important to us. Right. And we've, we've found, I, I think, in um, what we did in Mercury, I mean, the lessons learned there, we did a start to apply this. And even when we follow up with these five now, because tomorrow we start the presentations. Correct. Right? They land here tomorrow, and we've got them all lined up over the next two days. Um, but we asked them additional questions. Sure. And some of the, some of the things that we asked were, uh, how are you going to support a container solution, and how are you going to support different container solutions. Right. I may have a, a container that needs outside air to cool it. I may have a container that needs, um, you know, a, a, a water, you know, a closed water loop to cool yep. it. H how do you crack that nut? And then, oh, by the way, we have to be able to maintain it. And oh, by the way, you have to be able to maintain it in the wintertime or when it's raining. So how, how do you solve that problem? That was a big question that we had asked. Yeah. And I think uh, the, all the learnings that we had inside of um, Phoenix. So whether it's the trimming, so the hot water cooling and the ability for us to go back and, and uh, get free cooling year-round. And we're able to now achieve that within Phoenix based on the solutions. So it's easier in Salt Lake, but we wanted to know how they were going to do it. Correct. Okay. And then the same thing with uh, stranded power, I believe, right? Right. So that's some of the limitations in Phoenix. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so we're pushing the industry to provide highly dense racks, the denser the better, as far as we're concerned, more compute, less footprint. Um, one of the issues that we have in Phoenix is, what if we're using legacy equipment or different business units that don't have mm -hmm. high, highly dense equipment? How do we utilize the space that we have, the power that we have, given that we might need to expand our footprint? So that's one sure. of the questions that, that we ask of them is, how do you, if, if we come in with a lot of lower density equipment, how do you handle that? If they're highly dense equipment, how do you handle that? Because that's a, a significant engineering challenge to be able to, to plan for both. Yeah, and that's, that definitely is one of the realities we're facing today. So we've got a lot of dense stuff going into Phoenix, um, but we also have some legacy, as Mike said, that we have to have certain data warehouse things and those things. We're influencing the rest of it, but suddenly we have a big chunk of space consumed by lower density. So how do we make sure we optimize if we've got two megawatts deployed for one area that can't be utilized in another location? How do we make sure we don't have that problem in Salt Lake City? Full flexibility. Okay. So uh, the other thing that we want to make sure that we never do again is containers on the roof. <laughs> yes. It's really fun. It was cool. But if we don't have to, we won't. <laughs> so it's easy for us to go back and land a container on the top, but all the steel we had to put in, all the different things in there, and we we're bound by the space we had, right? And we worked in it, and we're, we've optimized that. Okay. But uh, here we've got a green field. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the observations of these submissions. So what did you see when they came in? Um, I guess the f first thing that when we got the submissions was, and I'm a nuts and bolts kind of guy, mm -hmm. um, I normally be the person who will go straight to the electrical and mechanical single lines, yeah, yeah. but it was different. You, We actually had to spend a day go through and go, going through them, looking at the building concept. The architecture. The architecture, which is, you know, when you look at it, I don't want to say architecture, but more, yeah, architecture, but space layout, how mm -hmm. they utilize the space. Um, so that was the big thing we really looked at for a start. And then we started getting into the nuts and bolts. Yeah. Um, we saw everything, you know, from, as you would say, the Jetsons yeah. to very traditional, very conventional design to, you know, something in between. And that's kind of where we where yeah. we look for, you know, like, so. Yeah, and I think the, the Jetson one was interesting because it was just so different, right? Like, like similar to the, some of the things we had last year. Yes. Um, but it was... Wow, you know, that, that's pretty creative. Um, but, you know, we had that extreme, and of course, we just had warehouses or just containers all outside or something like that. But how do you deal with that in December? Right, okay. so that was, that was very interesting as going through the process 
and seeing 20 different vendors view of how they were going to solve our problem right. and just the the breadth and the width of different responses that we have was interesting to go through. Yeah, and I want to make sure the industry uh, understands especially all 78 of those companies or 68 of those that were were uh, interested in participating. We know it was a lot of work and that's why of course we're compensating the five finalists for for that too. There is something that when you get to this this uh, end, there's not one single winner that we can say for <laughs> they get every but the five are are covered. Um, so let's talk about the uh, top five and why they were selected. Oh, well, as we said, uh, space planning was a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the electrical mechanical designs, the efficiency that they brought in, yeah. um, the team that they have in place. There was a number of different uh, reasons. All of that was uh, that we went through our score sheet. Um, it's a subjective score in many cases, but it's an objective way to do a subjective task and score, you know, yeah. score these different designs. And and I think I think, you know, as we went through last time, I think that process worked pretty well. And I think that was for the number of designs that we had to go through and review, I I think that's the best way to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And and the the spread between the five finalists was anywhere from between twelve to fifteen points. Correct. Right. So they were pretty close together. And and that's great because now we've got a real competition going on. Right. It's not just there's a clear winner already or somebody that's leading the pack. We literally have some of the top folks in the industry that have come back with some pretty incredible designs. Mm -hmm. And they've solved our problem based on what's on the paper. Now we go back and put them through the gauntlet. Okay, so sure. why don't we, uh, <laughs> which is very fun. Um, <laughs> yes, why don't we uh, go ahead and say who the five finalists are? Sure, so the five finalists are Advanced Design Consultants, Dearns and Gensler, Kling Stubbins, M&W, and finally Winter Street in conjunction with AHA. Cool. So let the battle begin. So two days, uh, what's after this, once we get through these presentations? So the next two days we go through uh, the presentations from the top five, um, then we go through, hopefully within a week we'll be able to at least choose a top two, and then we would go through some more uh, interviews slash uh, engineering slash question and answer um, to, to be able to pick a winner. So within the next month we should be able to pick the uh, top engineering firm. Excellent, that will go out and build Quicksilver. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, I'm very anxiously awaiting the presentations tomorrow as people uh, tell us how they're better than each other. <laughs> so thank you very much for watching, and stay tuned for additional episodes of Data Center Pulse.